And I want to start by uh, thanking Jenny Mason as well for accommodating my schedule. Once the, I was originally scheduled for the cartographic design session tomorrow, but something had come up, unfortunately, at my university that required me to, to, to get back there. So um, I appreciate her uh, squeezing me in here. And thanks to my other pre fellow presenters here for letting me uh, kind of crash the session here um, with you. So as a cartographer who has a lot of interest in, in human geography, I've always been fascinated by um, what I call cultural um, maps. Um, basically, kind of my definition of cultural maps, um, maps that elicit insights into the geography of, of some cultural trait. And I guess, in particular, what I'll focus on here is maps that display ethnicity, language, and or religion, so those um, three um, things. So I've uh, made some of these maps and I've looked at a lot more of them and have just been um, become very curious about how we do this, how we make these maps and, um, and what they tell us and, 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 and some of the design challenges. Well, when we look at these maps, there's, these have a, a rich history. We can look, of course, at the, the Mapamundi in the Middle Ages um, and you know, the influence of religion on those maps. Um, we have maps of language distributions um, at least as early as the late 16th century. And um, as Robert, uh, Arthur Robertson details in his book on the history of thematic mapping, um, when we get the rise of national statistics collected by government agencies in the 19th century, um, we get a lot of data, of course, that is mappable. And so cartographers um, then take this and, and, and begin to make a lot of thematic maps that um, show these, these variables. So I'll just give a couple examples of, of what I mean when we talk about cultural maps. Um, this is one, this is um, a Census Bureau map of largest ancestry groups. Um, and when you look at this, you'll see um, a variety of different groups here. So um, American Indians here, um, Dutch in the purple, or I'm sorry, in the green, um, African Americans in sort of this purplish color, Germans in the blue, so forth and, and so on. Um, another example, these are increasingly are becoming um, more interactive in, in um, web mapping environments. This is the landscape project at the University of Maryland. Um, basically that leverages a database of over 6,000 different languages. So you can go in here, um, view the maps, um, interactive, click on um, different polygons and, and, uh, and explore them that way. There are a lot of diverse uses for these types of, of maps, just a few of which I've listed on the screen here. Um, you'll find these commonly used in education. Um, so um, think of geography textbooks, um, human geography, world regional geography, maps that um, it, you know, depict the ethnic, linguistic, and religious diversity of a particular place or the world as a whole. We'll see these in news media as, as well. A lot of times these will be used as supplements to current event stories, so issues related to migration or refugee crises, uh, demographic changes, um, ethnic or religious conflict. Um, these types of maps will appear in, in the news media for that. Uh, cultural protection or preservation or awareness. Um, these types of maps have been used to threaten uh, um, by um, threaten cultural groups to preserve their culture. Um, and specifically, we find a lot of examples of this looking at languages, languages that are threatened, and using the map to bring awareness to the endangered status of the language and hopefully to preserve them. A lot of political um, and governance and policy aspects of these types of maps as well. Uh, and the use of these in conflict resolution, peacekeeping, um, political boundary negotiations after a conflict, um, examples from World War I, examples um, in, in Bosnia in the 1990s, um, and, and the, the use of these maps to um, negotiate boundaries and, and, and things like that. Obviously, there are a lot of, of very negative and controversial aspects of these maps as well. And unfortunately, a lot of examples of how these have been used for marginalization, um, maps that promote oppression or discrimination of a, of a cultural group. So think of examples of you know, redlining, for example, uh, maps in US cities in the 1940s, um, ethnic minorities singled out, and then um, those maps used for discriminatory um, home um, loan um, programs. So kind of my objective here is to assess the overall state of cultural mapping. Um, so look um, kind of generally at these maps that depict ethnicity, language, or religion. And I really have kind of three um, main um, goals here. Um, I'm interested in the geographic insights that these maps provide. So in other words, what do these maps tell us? Um, what symbology and data handling techniques are used? So how, as cartographers, how do we do this? And then um, lastly, um, think a little bit about some of the major design challenges. Obviously, we 
know every type of map has, has certain unique challenges. And so what might those be for these cultural uh, maps? And I think when you know, we, I look at this, I think about you know, the future of these maps and how um, these are um, used commonly. And as data sets become increasingly more available, um, I think there's gonna be a, a continued need for these, these types of maps. So one of the things I did here early on was I wanted to kind of understand how this has been done. And so I did um, an inventory of maps that display ethnicity, language, or, or religion. Um, I was interested in finding as many maps as I could and to then start to sort these out or, or categorize these, these maps. So I looked at a lot of different um, sources, um, national mapping agencies, um, atlases, textbooks, news media, um, and then maps in, in map library collections, um, specifically the Library of Congress. Um, a lot of these, as you'll see, are there's a US bias to these, these maps very strongly. That was kind of my, my my initial focus so far, um, I've focused on, tried to focus on contemporary maps, but also um, did not restrict um, that to my analysis. I'm also interested in how um, we have done this historically and how these maps have changed. So you'll see some of the examples I'll show will go back into the 1950s, 1960s, and then some of them a little more um, contemporary. Um, didn't restrict doing geographic restriction on, on maps. So some of these maps will show urban areas. Some will show, um, uh, you know, in the United States. Some will show the U.S. as a whole. Some of them show different countries or, or the, the world. So essentially what I did is, is I cataloged a couple of things for each of the maps that I looked at. Um, I was interested in the geographic patterns that these maps show. So in other words, what are, these, what are the insights that these maps provide individually? Um, the symbology, data handling, and then the design challenges or the limitations. So far, I'm up to around 300 or so um, total maps. And um, as, uh, you know, as I see more things, I uh, am constantly adding them into the, into the mix here. So let me talk just a little bit about um, categorizing these cultural maps. So these are the, the six main types that, um, as I've thought about these and, and thought about how they, they fit into um, the broader scheme of things. Uh, qualitative distribution maps, traditional knowledge maps, quantitative distribution maps, diversity index maps, bivariate, multivariate maps, and then time series uh, maps. So um, say a few words about each of these um, oops, wait a minute here, sorry. I lost the thing here. Is it, did it just kind of short out there for a second? There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, qualitative distribution um, maps. Um, you know, I think the question here that these maps, I think, elicit is or, or demonstrate is, you know, where, where is cultural group X? So kind of a, a simple sort of a question. Um, looking at the symbology for these, um, area and line symbols, area of most common, um, qualitative visual variables, color, hue, um, pattern, texture, um, sometimes text is added to these maps as, uh, as well. Um, this is just one example of, of this. This is looking at uh, major ethnic groups in Central Asia, um, pretty standard in terms of different colors, um, splashes of colors representing different um, ethnic groups on the, the map. Another example, this one comes from a human geography textbook, so looking at urban areas, um, Chicago on the left here, Los Angeles on the right, and again, using color to show the dominant um, um, ethnic group. So showing not how much, but just showing where um, the, the dominant one is. Um, next group here, uh, traditional knowledge maps. These, I think, are, are among the most unique of these, the different categories here. Here, the focus is on the human side of, of the story, um, the most humanistic, the most qualitative. Um, looking at um, where are features significant to, to different cultural groups, so um, very humanistic. These are the types of maps that are oftentimes used for cultural preservation, um, showing, again, using qualitative symbols, but 
most importantly, using multimedia, um, sound, video, images, um, to convey the, the humanistic aspects of, of a language, for example. Um, these types of, of maps are, I would argue, the most democratic as well, because they oftentimes will involve indigenous peoples or other voices that um, are allowed to, or contribute to the maps and, and much of the content of the, the maps. Um, this is one example, one of the atlases that's developed at, at Carleton um, University. I won't try to pronounce the, the name here in, in, in fear of, of not doing it correctly, but just to give you an example of the text and the image um, that is mapped um, and linked to the, the language. Quantitative distribution maps. So we find, of course, a lot of these types of maps. Um, again, where is cultural group X, but also how much is, is there. So the, the very overwhelmingly favorite type of, of symbology used for these, um, choropleth maps using a, a value scheme. Um, some examples of proportional graduate symbol maps, um, dot maps, cartograms very, very rarely, um, but there are a few examples of, of those. Um, just to look at some of these, um, this is one, um, a National Geographic map looking at the dominant um, religions around the world and we have a different hue for each different religion and then of course the value scheme here showing um, how much um, for each of those. Here's another example, uh oh. Okay, sorry about that, maybe I need to I think my connector might be going out here. Okay, what did we do before there, Amy? All right, right there. Okay, I'm gonna hang on to this thing. Um, a National Geographic map, this just came out looking at um, ethnic diversity in urban areas. Um, and so kind of focused on New York here, kind of a similar type of, of symbology. Um, here's another one. This is a map looking at ethnic distributions in, um, in the former Yugoslavia. You could see the ethnic diversity here in Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, minority groups, and then where a group is a majority um, in the, the, the darker shades there. Um, this is an example of a, a, a dot map um, by Eric Fisher um, is showing languages that are used on Twitter. So we have a dot map and then the color is, codes the, the type of language that is, is spoken. Another example here of a dot map, this one um, coming from the University of Virginia. Um, as a, many of you may have seen this one. Um, this is again looking in Chicago. So a dot map where the dot value is one. One dot per one person using census block data um, for the 2010 census and color coded by the different ethnic groups. So again, we can kind of see where we have um, a little bit of mixing in some of the more diverse areas, parts of the cities like uh, Rogers Park and Albany Park. And of course, we still see some segregation between ethnic groups as, as well. Um, this infographic, kind of a cartogram-like infographic. Yeah, I can. Let's see here. Okay, there we go. Um, showing the size of languages relative in the circle here, and then the color codes to the different um, parts of the world where those languages are spoken. So here's Mandarin Chinese right here, here's English, and then coding up with the, the region on the map there. Um, diversity index maps are, I think, efficient in the sense that they create a, a, a diversity index. So take lots of different languages and come up with an index. So typically, um, uh, a value, a low value is not much diversity, a high value is a lot of diversity. So here's one example um, from Esri, the racial and ethnic diversity layer that they have. So looking, um, the darker blue area is more ethnically diverse and the lighter, less ethnically um, diverse. Here's another one. Um, these are done for ethnicity, but also for language. Another example of this from National Geographic. Time series maps, um, where is a cultural group spread over time? So like thinking of diffusion and the process of diffusion, and then also looking at distributions that have changed between two different time periods. So lots of, of common um, temporal types of symbology, flow maps, um, small multiples, animation, and bivariate choropleth maps. 
Here's one example. This is um, a flow map looking at the diffusion of French, Portuguese, and Spanish that um, comes from a, a, a textbook. This is a map by National Geographic looking at change in the Latino population from 2000 to 2016. So using a, um, a diverging color scheme to show um, where that population has increased and where it has not. Let's see here, try it again, there we go. Okay, just about there, hold on with me here, projector. Um, bivariate map showing um, from the Washington Post here, um, showing diversity um, in the United States and change from 2000 to 2014. So this one, um, low diversity and a, already, and then a big increase in, in change in the diversity in the yellows, high diversity already in the blues, and little change. So using a bivariate corpuscle map to show that, that change. Um, this one from the New York Times, an immigration explorer. Um, you can scroll along here and see over the last 120 years or so the dominant ethnic group in a particular um, place. Um, bivariate um, cultural maps, comparing one trait to another trait. So one example would be this map here, um, looks at different um, languages in Iran, and then you'll see the point symbols here show the different, um, uh, whether it's Shia or, or Sunni Muslim, um, so incorporating religion there as well. Um, let me just end with just a couple of design challenges, and I want to say I don't have all the answers here, and I think this has raised a lot of questions for me more than, than anything. Um, one of the questions that I have when you look at these maps is the design of the qualitative symbols. As you can see, there's a lot of splashes of color here. Um, what is needed versus what is interpretable, I think, is a, is a key question. That a tiered or hierarchical structure, I think, is very important and can be helpful here and um, allows us to combine visual variables as, uh, as, as well. So just an example here, this one is a map of language groups in Indonesia. If we zoom in, color is for the major language family, and then you'll notice the, the addition of text here to show the actual location of the languages, so um, adding that other aspect. Um, this one here, similar thing, showing ethno-linguistic um, regions with the color, and then the grid coordinates here show the specific um, ethno-linguistic um, group there. Um, data limitations. We obviously have the MOP problem here, um, given the, how these statistics are collected. And one of the things that I think about, particularly when you look at the maps that show religion, how do you measure the immeasurable, um, as Cutter, Gallage, and Graf um, proposed? Um, issues of uncertainty, issues of completeness with the data, and should that be shown um, or, or, or not? Or will that just confuse map users? Representing cultural convergence, what's the nature of the boundary? A lot of times the, there are, we show this with the sharp lines, um, boundaries, should there be fuzzy boundaries um, or, or not? Just, just an example, if you look into this map, this is for the DRC, and looking at the different ethnic groups, so we tend to draw these lines on the map like this. Um, this one shows no lines, so it just uses the text to show ethnic groups in North Africa and the Middle East, so showing no sort of, of boundaries. This is a rare example. Um, this is my, my dialect map from the New York Times. And what I find interesting about this, instead of showing lines like the typical isogloss lines, um, showing kind of a, um, a, a gradient um, between different dialect um, regions. Okay, and then here's the last slide right here. So I guess, um, I think these maps can provide a lot of insights into a range of questions related to human culture. Um, the challenge, I think, is balancing the human story, the qualitative, with the geographic patterns that we oftentimes like to see in a statistical thematic map. And I think what these, some of these questions have raised for me more than anything is the need for user-centered um, studies um, to look at some of these things related to uncertainty or the nature of the boundaries and whether map users understand that or if it's best just to, to not even go down that road. So thank you again for your patience with the technology. Um, I appreciate it. for being so unflappable with that. Um, we have time for one question. <coughs> Martin. Yeah, so if you haven't done this, um, 
go in. It's kind of fun. Um, oh, it's not on the screen. There we go. So this one. There we go. Um, so you, 25 questions. Um, which you, word do you use to describe something? Is it pop soda or Coke? You know, that type of thing. And then you get your own custom map that is, is generated that shows kind of where your, your dialect um, is, is spoken. Um, I, was, I am right from that area near Aurora, about 15 miles away from it. So it did a pretty good job, at least for me. All right, great. If you've got any more questions, uh, you can grab them at lunch. So I want to thank all of this, the session speakers today for a great session.